This video is brought to you by NordVPN. Head over to nordvpn.com slash YBOC for 68% off a two-year plan and four months free. Plus, it just really helps the show. Oh, ho, ho. happy holidays, nerds. My name is St. Dr. Jordan Breeding, and I would say Merry Christmas but somebody on the internet said that was illegal now and I'm kind of in enough trouble as is. You're watching a special Christmas themed episode of Your Brain on Christmas, the show where I only actually have one Christmas idea really, but you know, SEO takes precedence and it's also the only show on Cracked where literally the first thing I ever talked about was Christmas and nerds, I'm feeling nostalgic. Not only do your parents already know that Santa got you a life-size anatomically correct Lego replica of Black Widow, they stayed up all the night helping Santa put it together, the lazy bitch. I am lactose intolerant. Anyway, today I'll make like Santa Claus does whenever he enters a person's home while they sleep and perform a soft crime by diagnosing. Psychopaths are like he's that are actually she's that are actually changelings. You don't always recognize them for what they are. In that case, be extra careful. Movies usually do such a good job distracting us with explosions and boobs, we don't notice actual fully unhinged lunatics just sitting there being, you know, crazy. But I notice them because I have a degree in Yuletide psycho spotting. Elf follows Will Ferrell, his buddy, a human orphan who was found in Santa's bag of toys after a wild drunken night of giving gifts to children. Santa and his Bob Newhart looking elves raise the boy as one of Santa's little helpers until the day he leaves for New York City to seek out his biological father. And after finding love and saving his buddy heads back home to the North Pole where he truly belongs and drags along his human wife who almost certainly does not belong because, let's back up for a second, Santa found a baby on Christmas Eve and decided to just keep him? Look at you. Then he raises the kid specifically to work for him for no pay forever. <laughs> Santa makes no effort to return the child to the orphanage from whence he came. And you might think it'd be hard to remember which one, but Santa knows exactly where Buddy's dad and everybody else lives. So surely he could figure out where he accidentally abducted the child from. And even if not, maybe he could use his powers to find a loving home with good people who probably want nothing more for than to raise a child of their own. And again, Santa knows who Buddy's real father is, and even though, granted, he is a naughty daddy, he's also a human daddy. But instead of trying to repair that broken family, Santa instead opts to raise the child in a hostile environment populated by, for all intents and purposes, aliens. In the movie, the North Pole is the exclusive realm of elves, mystical creatures whose biological makeup is considerably different from a human being's. Buddy grows twice as fast and large as his coworkers, but there's never any attempt to accommodate him. Everything about his living situation is ridiculously undersized. He's terrible at his job because he has normal human reflexes instead of preternatural elf finger dexterity, and they force him to eat an elvish diet, which may I remind you is a surefire path to an early snow grave. They better have a doctor as talented as me up there in a medical clinic stocked with insulin shots because Buddy 100% has hyperdiabetes, not to mention malnourishment and rotten teeth. Oh, by the way, don't eat the yellow snow. Oh, I know that. Raising a human child in this environment is like finding a baby bird in your yard, but opting to raise it in the toilet because you just don't feel like getting the ladder out of the garage. Even if you are maladjusted enough to think that keeping random children like Lucky Pennies is fine as long as they're orphans, remember the day after Christmas, that orphanage will have to report a missing child. A child who is now at the North Pole and will never ever be found. The children love the books. That's right, an innocent social worker is going to prison because Santa had already changed into his comfy pants and didn't feel like going back out in the snow. Back off, Slick. I'm a little old fashioned. When I run some teenage boy over with my car so hard they fall unconscious, I at least consider taking them to the hospital before dragging their lifeless body into my home, removing their clothes and stuffing them into my underage daughter's bed. And even if I did do those things in this completely unreal hypothetical scenario, if they did wake up, I would at a minimum check them for a concussion and at least take note of anything they said that sounded like maybe they weren't thinking super clearly. You know, because I hit them with a car and dragged them for 17 miles before I noticed. It's hypothetically. Oh, 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 oh,
I mean, it's as my grandma always says, if you plow some pedestrian to sleep with your motor wagon, the safest options are either taking them to a doctor warehouse or driving away as fast as possible. Less culpability. Of course, the experience of it was somewhat different. Well, Marty's grandparents in Back to the Future clearly didn't know my grandmother. Either that or they're full-on social nihilists who don't give a shit about anybody. Let me explain. Sam, here's the young man you hit with your car out there. He's all right, thank God. What were you doing in the middle of the street, a kid your age? Don't pay any attention to him. He's in one of his moods. Okay, so Marty's grandpa slams into Marty with his car. That's bad. Sure, but it's also not really his fault. I mean, Marty and more specifically his dad were dicking around in the street after trying to get a quick glimpse of Marty's mom's areolas. Although on the flip side, this clearly isn't Marty's grandpa's first rodeo. Another one of these damn kids jumped in front of my car! Either Lorraine is extremely popular with local perverts, or Marty's grandpa is extremely bad at not running children over. Or maybe both. Either way, feels like he should consider changing something about the situation. Buy some blinds. Don't drive. I spilled beer all over when that car smashed into me. But okay, at least Grandpa brings Marty inside to keep an eye on him and his injuries instead of letting him bleed out in the street, but that's really only a nice thing for like, what, 20 minutes, tops? Lorraine reveals Marty was unconscious for freaking nine hours. How long have you been there? A nine few hours. You're telling me that kid you hit with a car was asleep for more than an entire work day and you never once considered taking him to the hospital? He could be in a freaking coma for all you know. He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. Even worse, once Marty does manage to stumble downstairs, he starts spouting a bunch of nonsense about having seen TV shows that haven't aired and mentioning politicians that nobody knows and referring to roads that have never been built. Lorraine says that Marty should spend the night because they almost killed him with the car and Marty's grandma's basically like, oh yeah, I mean, I guess. Uh, yeah, you could spend the night if you want. I mean, here, take my daughter as penance for my sins. Sleep with her. You're so, uh, you're so, and when Marty hops up to leave because his mom won't stop trying to, you know, squeeze his dick under the table, his grandma just says that he's a strange boy. And his grandpa takes it a step further and says he's an idiot. Both are interesting names to call somebody whose brain is probably misfiring a bit, you know, due to getting slammed onto the pavement by a moving car. Can somebody chase after that kid? Or at least call an ambulance for the love of crap? When I was your age, I never chased a boy or the boy. In the first X-Men movie, one of Mutant Hind's worst enemies was Senator Robert Kelly. Kelly was staunchly anti muty and advocated for a mutant registry. He believed mutants were too dangerous to be allowed to roam free without normal people knowing what they're capable of. To counter his argument, a naked blue woman and her man-frog friend kidnapped him and just melted him into goo. It was a very compelling argument. This is how Congress should resolve all debates. <laughs> After Kelly liquefies, Mystique takes his form and impersonates him in the Senate to advocate for mutant rights. X-Men fans still aren't sure about this particular issue. I mean, sure, his views were a little fascist, but it also seems reasonable to know which nearby people might suddenly blast lasers or squirt acid. And also, I think killing people and impersonating them afterwards is bad. Right? I don't know. We may never know who is right. You're wasting your time, shiny Jesus. All I know is that Mystique played the role of Senator Kelly for way, way too long. She's still impersonating Kelly in the second film, running around in his pink human skin with his pink human dong, fighting for mutant casual Fridays or whatever. This is a problem though, because Mystique can't just pretend to be Senator Kelly whenever mutant right discussions pop up. She has to attend every single bull at town hall meeting. She has to call donors. She has to get fitted for tuxedos. She has to sexually harass his secretary and sleep with the man's wife, which, yeah, there's that. Ugh. She has to do it right too, or she'll get found out. Does Mrs. Kelly like dirty talk? Role playing? Do Mystique's shape changing powers automatically make her junk the perfect size? Or does she have to guess based on Kelly's goo puddle? Regardless, this is legally rape, right? What's the matter, baby? You don't think I look pretty like this? But maybe she does know, but the sex is so good, Mrs. Kelly doesn't care if it's really her husband or not. Like, maybe Mystique can rib her shape-shifted penis for her pleasure. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that X2 is basically a face-off sequel. By fully concentrating on her needs and pleasures, he brought her to the point where she reciprocated for him and found herself a newly devout worshiper at the altar of his sex. Ugh. And what about when Mystique isn't banging her new wife? What is the Kelly family gonna talk about at dinner? Hello, new fa old family. Hey, just for fun, why don't we go around and say a few of our favorite hobbies and then our names. My name is John C. Every 
single day for months, Mystique is gonna be thrown into all sorts of awkward situations as she stumbles through the life of this dead man she's pretending to be. And the thing is, people in that world know there are evil mutants and that one of them is a shapeshifter and it's perfectly sane to assume that said shapeshifter might target mutant kind's most vocal political opponent. So she has to be flawless in her performance, as meticulous as a sociopath hiding their serial killer tendencies for decades. Ah! Bruce Almighty is the story of a man who gains all the power in the universe and uses that power to fix the world by inflating Jennifer Aniston's boobs and murdering a shit ton of Japanese people. It is a cute, cute movie. Obviously, Bruce makes for an incredibly terrible god, but from what we see in the movie, he's actually the best god the world's ever seen. Because here's the deal, Morgan Freeman does not give a shit. Clap one, clap one, the clapper. <laughs> Just can't get it out of my head, man. Well, good luck with that. See, Bruce wouldn't have killed all those Japanese people or shoved all those monkeys up people's asses if Morgan Freeman didn't give him the power to do so in the first place. And when Bruce fairly asks God whether he's pulled some stunt like this before and just given up for a while, God asks Bruce if he's ever heard of the Dark Ages and then laughs, presumably remembering all the peasants whose extremities turned black and fell off. Nice one, God. And he saw that it was good. Hilarious. Once again, your unwillingness to do your damn job will end thousands, maybe millions of people's lives. Obviously, there's the aforementioned Japanese tidal wave created by Bruce screwing with the moon so he could screw with large-breasted Jennifer, but there's also worldwide violent mass riots in the wake of Bruce just answering everybody's prayers with a yes. Yeah, everybody's prayers. <laughs> And then later, ignoring the mountains of corpses, Morgan Freeman laments at how just damned whiny everybody is and how they're always looking up for help. Of course they're looking up. Isn't that the whole thing? Morgan Freeman is basically just like, please, leave me the hell alone. I wanna go inflate some boobs on my own time. And Morgan further tips his detached deist hand when he says, parting your soup is not a miracle, Bruce. It's a magic trick. A single mom who's working two jobs and uh, still finds time to take her kid to soccer practice that's a miracle. Quite frankly, I'm tired of it. So, so you're saying, Morgan, that you see her impossible struggle and you just choose to not get involved. Like, you don't want to get her a promotion at one of her jobs or a green light on the way to soccer practice. I'm not sure anything in her life qualifies as a miracle unless she's also feeding the entire soccer team at halftime with a single orange. Did that orange just come out your crack, man? Hey kids, it's me, Santa. You can tell that it's Santa because I'm wearing a lot of red, like Santa does who I am. I wanted to give you an update on your presents for this year. Your Christmas presents. I'm not afraid to say it. My first plan was to buy you all the John Wick movies on Blu-ray, cause that guy is so darn cool. But as it turns out, they cost a lot. And I don't have much besides elf money. So what I thought was, well, I'll just let them subscribe to Netflix or something and they can watch it on there. But as it turns out, unless you live in Australia, you can't watch John Wick. You can't watch it on Netflix. Whose idea was that? So what I've decided to do instead is get you a big discount on NordVPN because when you use NordVPN, you can change your IP address to look like you're in Australia and then you can watch all the John Wick movies on your own. Just go to NordVPN slash YBOC, which stands for Yuletide, baby. Oh, Christmas. And then you get friggin' 68% off a two-year plan and four months free. And if you wanna watch something that's not John Wick, that's fine, there's lots of countries. As your dad mentioned earlier, there's horse shows, if that's your thing, in Canada. And don't forget, the whole thing is backed by a top cybersecurity firm, which means that perverts can't get you. And I don't like perverts, because I'm Santa. Santa doesn't like perverts. They're on the naughty list. They get coal every year. And remember, NordVPN has a 30-day risk-free guarantee, which means that if you don't like what I've given you, what I've blessed you with, you can return it after 30 days, get all your money back, no harm, no foul. Santa has a thick skin, he can take it. So anyway, remember, go to nordvpn.com slash YVOC today, sign up, and you can thank Santa for all of your John Wicking. And as they say in It's a Wonderful Life, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter! Happy New Year to you! In jail! Yeah, so, all right, accused Santa of severe child abuse. Marty's grandparents have attempted second degree homicide and uh, call me Kratos, baby, because I just slew a god. This is true as well. Anyway, be sure to see Kathy on your way out to grab some antipsychotics in case you see God and or Morgan Freeman so you could just you know, shove them in their mouth. And you may want, want some for yourself because if you're seeing God, that's not super common unless he's in a manger. Merry Christmas.
Christmas. And remember, they're backed by a top cybersecurity firm, which keeps the perverts away. And they're, I don't like perverts, because they're cutting into my game of breaking into your house. But I'm giving you toys. They're giving you herpes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna use this.